I mean, how how does your device find out where you are and how you are moving? And we begin the lecture with something that is uh, a little bit of a misconception. So, if you are watching these kind of uh, sci-fi movies or uh, anything to do with criminal investigations, very often somebody is tracking somebody and you hear this word triangulation very often. They say something like, we use the satellites and uh, triangulate their location and find out where they are, or, or something along those terms. And uh, actually what I want to tell you is that that is not true. They don't use triangulation with the satellites, they use some other thing. But this one sounds so cool that probably they are using it into their uh, they're adding it into their script to sound fancy. The other one sounds even more fancy, but uh, this one, yeah. So I will teach you later what they actually use. But for now, let's learn what is triangulation and what it's useful for. For example, you have this river here, and you want to build a bridge or something across it, and you want to know how big is the river. But, uh, I mean, how, how wide is the river? But you don't really want to get your clothes wet, so how would we find out now this, this distance some other way than crossing the river? It's more or less, uh, the idea is to move sideways, so you basically can move along that direction a certain amount of distance, a certain distance, but you measure this distance, so it's a distance that you actually know. And then after you end up to the other side, you look at the same point again, but now you also have an angle measurement here. So you don't see it directly anymore, you see it at an angle. So the thing is that this looks like a very simple geometry problem where you have to find x knowing these other values in the triangle. And that's more or less it. That's what triangulation is all about. You can uh, find <coughs> objects if you know the angle and some distance measurement. So this angle is part of triangulation. So this is why this is called uh, triangulation, because it uses this kind of angle. So how would we find this x value here in this example? Tangent. So a mathematical function, trigonometric function. Tangent of 60 degrees. Uh, oh. The tangent is x over tangent of 60 is x over 100. So it's tangent of 60 times 100. X is tangent of 60 times 100. Okay, so what is tangent of, of this angle if we look at this uh, ratio here? So it's x divided by 100. So you did this step first, and then from that you came up to the conclusion for, for x. Right. Okay, so how much is it? How much is tangent of 60 degrees? Square root of three, I think, but I'm not sure. Wow, you're really good. So x is uh, 100 square root, times square root of three. Okay, so how did you know the tangent of x is square root of three? Didn't you know? <laughs> no, like... Well, I, I know from this type of book. <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that I, I used to learn trigonometry with. So. We, uh, we have the same background because that's what I did as well. <laughs> okay, you're from Romania. Yeah. Yes, so I have here uh, sine of 60, cosine, tangent, cotangent, whatever it tells me, it's square root of 3. Okay, there are many ways you can find out these and nowadays there is no problem. You just type in math that tangent of whatever angle and the computer just knows how to give you numerical answer for everything 
and it's also going to tell you how much is this approximately. Thank you. Yes, so what is our length of the river here? Okay, so we found out that without knowing the, without passing the river and grabbing a string with us or whatever silly method. So this is about what triangulation is about. And now we will check to move how you identify where people are using uh, satellites or whatever positioning system and we see how it's different from this triangulation. But this is also a very useful thing that I urge you to think if you can use in some of your projects here. But anyway, so uh, this triangulation is not only used to measure uh, things across the river, because maybe you could actually cross it with a boat or whatever, but something that we actually can't do at the moment is visit far away galaxies or stars or whatever. And that's the same kind of thing that is happening here. So the Earth moves all the time. The Earth is constantly uh, changing its location, but it comes back to the location again and again. So if you look at something far away from different angles, something called parallax is more or less the same thing. And you can have an idea by how much the distance, the distant objects are, are changing uh, relative to the background, you have an idea of how far they are from you. So just to keep in mind that this tool is, is very handy uh, often. And two years ago, somebody implemented a phone app in this course project that used it to measure the height of objects without climbing the tree. So what they did more or less is they they had to walk a certain distance from the tree, and then they had to measure the angle here somehow. And to measure the angle, well, more or less they used the accelerometer device, an accelerometer sensor in their device. So it's possible to actually take your phone, point it up somehow, and then some angle changes. And that's what they did. And if you want to know technicalities about how this thing can actually work, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. So your phone has inside this type of gyroscope. I don't know if anybody has seen a gyroscope before. But most likely you have because, for example, they are part of these, uh, they are more or less it's one of the reasons why your bicycle doesn't fall off when you are moving. So, gyroscope is more or less some kind of device that can maintain its orientation. And it maintains its orientation even if the mobile phone is going to tilt in a certain way. And your phone actually has one of these things, very small, one of these small things inside it. So even if your phone is going to move in a certain angle, this thing won't. And it's going to tell your phone how much it's rotating in a certain angle. Your phone also has another neat thing inside it that can tell you where the north is. Magnetism and this kind of... Uh, where the, where the north is. So using that, it can also figure out an absolute value for its movement. Because otherwise, these angles may be changed when your phone runs out of battery and then you restart it in some stupid position, in some upside down position or whatever. Everything would revert or would add an offset or something. But I believe, and I'm not exactly sure, that the uh, this magnetic sensor is the one that helps the accelerometer sensor uh, figure out absolute positioning so that it always knows up and down and, and uh, yeah 
So these gyroscopes, reason for your bike, one reason for your bike to stand up. Uh, when I was studying in uh, Romania in my bachelor's studies, these kind of things started to appear. They are some toys, uh, but they are marketed as gym equipment, more or less. This one is called a force ball, and uh, before this, I remember it when my roommates had something like this in in uh, in Romania. It was called power ball, I think. But anyway, the idea is you start to move it like this. You start to move it faster and faster, and it actually starts to accelerate. And it's more or less on the same principle as that one. But at some point, this becomes so hard to maintain that now I can't even hold it still anymore, even though I try. So it's actually working out my wrists or whatever, because it wants to be in the position that it wants to be, even though it's not pushing against any force or, or something like that. Anyway, so funny thing, and the light comes because of my uh, uh, force that I act upon it. There's no batteries inside. So it's uh, dy dy I, I'm not sure how it's called in English. Dynam something. <laughs> yeah, it's the opposite of an electric motor. So you actually generate electricity through, through movement. Okay, but anyway, so keep in mind that your phone has fancy things inside it that are very small and they are, uh, they are very helpful in these kind of things. And we will also have a demo with it at the end of this, I mean in the second half of this lecture. So we will program how to use the accelerometer quite soon. But now about the thing that you see in movies. So for your phone to work as a phone, you need to be somewhere in this radius R from a cell tower. The radius R means how far the signal can reach. And if you're going to be very close to the cell tower, then you have, are going to have very strong signal. But if you're going to move further away from the cell tower, the signal gets lower and lower until at some point it disappears. Now, if your cell tower is looking in its database and it's seeing which people are connected, which phones are connected, it can know that there is somebody connected and that that guy's signal is two lines here. So, it could actually figure out that this, this radius value here with a formula that looks something like that. You don't really have to measure this formula, to remember this formula, because this formula differs very much on the hardware that people use, on the type of the towers, on the strength of the antenna, if it's directional or not. There are so many things, I don't know half of them. But the idea is that the guys that are setting up these towers, your operator, Elisa, DNA, Sonera, whatever, they know the formula precisely. And then if they know this formula, they can figure out from here the radius, similar what we did before with the, with the tangent and the same kind of equation there. So knowing the radius, you actually know that your individual is somewhere around this circle because all the points on the circle have the same distance to the center point, the radius, right? That's what defines the circle. But if you have two of them, and I'm sure that Elisa, Sonera, whatever, they have more than one tower. <laughs> if you have two of them, and both of them pick up your, your ID, probably different signal values, unlikely for them to have the same signal, but they can calculate the radius to both of them, and then assuming we have this kind of situation, and assuming they know where the cell towers are, 
they can actually figure out that you have to be on one of those two locations. It's one or the other. Because you know this, this relationship. And if they have another one, then they can more or less outrule uh, the one behind. So you can see now that if you have three of them, you can pinpoint the person. But that's not actually very true because errors, noise, it can be anything. It can be differences in elevation. It can be rain outside. It can be uh, thick walls or whatever. They will not give you exactly that radius. It will give you the radius with an error margin. So you would somehow guess that the person is within this region, but not exactly on a specific point on the planet. The more of these signals, the more of these uh, towers or even Wi-Fi can be used for the, for the localization nowadays. The more of these uh, devices you have, the smaller this triangle area becomes. So uh, this is one reason why you can get very reliable location information without GPS, but using just the cell towers in the city, in an urban area, in a place with many, uh, many towers, or in a place with even many Wi-Fi um, emitters, like uh, routers. And you're probably going to ask, how do, you, how do you use the Wi-Fi signals to, to do that? And this is kind of a funny story. I'm not sure if it started with Nokia or if it started with Google, or uh, I really don't know, so don't quote me on this. I knew at some point, but I forgot. What they did is they were walking around town, or uh, you know that Google has this um, street view component that they take pictures on every road or whatever. Well, instead of just taking pictures, they record Wi-Fi uh, networks. That's it, more or less. They collect the database of what Wi-Fi networks are available in a city on this street and, and what is the signal strength of these networks. So they basically generate more uh, artificial seeds here in this situation. Of course, I maybe have a hotspot on right now or Wi-Fi's change or whatever, but some don't. And the ones that don't actually add up to more uh, reliable positioning uh, systems. And this is called, I think, cell ID databases so this is also one thing that your phone uses to localize itself. So it uses the cell towers, it uses cell ID databases, and then it's going to also use GPS. But uh, we'll get to that soon. Before that, do you know how to solve this problem? So. I mentioned before that this is a problem that uh, a mathematical problem it has two solutions so the person can be either here or here how would you solve this problem because this is your first exercise task take the equations of the circles and uh, find the intersection points okay so uh, you say take the Each equations circle, of the circle yeah has the equation okay what equation. is what is the equation of this circle? Uh, I'm sorry? X minus one, X minus one the whole square. Yeah. Plus y minus one the whole square. Equals? 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 Yeah, the, the root square. The radius. And the one oh, the radius. X minus five the whole square. It's not 4 square, it could be 2 square. Oh, the first equation. Are you sure? No. It's not 
Okay. Okay, so this is a system of equations, right? It means that uh, both of them have to be true if you want to be at this location here or at this location here. And this system of equations has two solutions. I'm not going to spend the time now to solve it, but uh, it will be your task how to solve this system of equations. Remember high school math, maybe. Or uh, Google it or whatever and know the answer on Monday next week. Uh, Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesday, yeah, sorry. And we will uh, have somebody show us how to answer this kind of question then. But uh, it's not very complicated, so doable. Okay. Oh, damn, it's the last slide. No, I was <laughs> clicking for nothing. Okay, so now let's talk about also GPS. And for that, I think we are going to start to talk about satellites. At least something about satellites. So this is now a really nice SVG from Wikipedia. I don't remember how I found it, but more or less if you if you go on Wikipedia and then you or Google and then just say satellites, Wikipedia, you probably get this a page that contains this image. This is a really nice image and it's the first time I learned that SVGs can actually interact with your mouse. I had no idea about this. It's, uh, it's quite, quite interesting. So we are on the Earth, somewhere around the Earth, and then here all sort of very interesting uh, things are floating around that we put there. For example, the International State, uh, Space Station is somewhere here. Actually very, very close to the Earth and really uh, moving really fast. They need to move fast. You will notice that the things that are closer to the Earth are moving faster than the, th than the things that are away from the Earth. This is because otherwise they would fall. Gravity doesn't just go away when you go farther away from the Earth, it's still there. But uh, the speed at which you are moving has to be far enough so that when you move towards Earth, you keep the same, the same radius. Now the ISS is actually really close. It could be that on a lucky situation, if the ISS is right above Joensu or right above Kuopio now, it could be that it is closer to us than Helsinki is. So, that close. But the satellites, they are going to be somewhere here. So, somewhere there is, well, somewhere in this range. You can actually see that you can fit another Earth here. And, and a half. <laughs> so, um, they are quite far away from us. They are quite far away from us. And all of these things, I believe, are, are uh, satellites for positioning. So we have the GPS that you hear quite often about. OK, they are actually, yeah, they are uh, links that you can click. So now I don't have to make a mistake. This Galileo is similar but from the European Union this GLONASS I guess Russian Chinese probably yeah so all of them can be used for this uh, position there now I don't think you need to know anything else but well, maybe something you, you would need to know. They are not on something that is called the geostationary orbit. 
geostationary orbit is this thing here. Mm. And the top that actually has also the dotted line moving. This geostationary orbit means that this satellite is always going to be above the same point on the Earth. So there could be a satellite always on, on top of your house. <laughs> it, it floats there, but I mean it moves, but your ro the Earth also rotates with the same speed that it's moving. It's a very sensitive location that you can put satellites on. And they are especially useful for uh, weather, for example for telling you about the weather, because if you want to know the weather in Rowan, so one of the best things is to have always the satellite there and know the weather all the time, not wait for a day or, or whatever to get the new weather reading. But just know that the satellites that we work with always change their uh, location, so new ones come and go all the time. And, uh, yeah, and there has to be a minimum of four satellites in sight for GPS to work. And if it doesn't work for some reason, if it's not enough, then your accuracy is going to be very, very bad. This can happen very often, like if you're at the bottom of a... If you're here at the bottom of some kind of cliff, and then the signals from satellites there don't reach you, but you only get two of them like that, this is one, one option. If you're indoors, it's not going to work. It's very sensitive to walls or things that can, that can block it. This is one uh, reason why the cell tower positioning is still used. Because it works in places where GPS doesn't. In fact, they are all complementary to each other. And to tell you the truth, I have no idea how phones really work nowadays because it's not really public. So the location sensor on your phone that we will also use today in the second demo, I'm not sure how it works. It used to be about eight years ago when I was looking at these uh, Nokia phones and uh, it is uh, <coughs> developing for Symbian. The phones had separate location coming from Wi-Fi, coming from cell tower, coming from GPS, and then from all these different sources, you can choose which one to use when and, and whenever you want. But now the phones give you just coordinates, and they don't tell you how it came. You can specify some things like, uh, give me as high precision as you can, and then you can guess that maybe it's going to use more GPS, but it's not a guarantee. If it thinks that there are enough Wi-Fi or cell towers in the region, it's going to use just that to preserve battery. Or I'm not sure if it does that. It's not public information. So the sensor that you use in your, in your phone is doing some very complicated things. It's not just GPS. But assuming that it's going to use the GPS, the differences when you're working with satellites are very few. So more or less, satellite emits a pulse. Satellite emits a pulse. So the phone doesn't send anything back to the satellites. This is one, one difference than the other, the other case. Now, the satellite emits this kind of pulse and say that you get that pulse on your phone. Your phone is a receiver. The phone can actually figure out what is the time uh, difference between when the satellite sent the value, sent the pulse, and what time is it now. So it can figure out how long it took for the signal to reach you. Signals move at the speed of light which is known, then you can also figure out the distance from that satellite. So if you receive a pulse from one satellite, you know that you're somewhere on this 3D sphere here, on the surface of this 3D sphere. If you add to that that, yes, I'm on top of the Earth, then you are somewhere along this circle. 
but usually it doesn't care about that because the, uh, the GPS system works even if you're out in space. Like the International Space Station uses to know where it is. Okay, and then the same thing happens for the second satellite. It also emits something and say that at some point you get, uh, you get its pulse. You figure out how far it is based on the delta time there. And now with two satellites, unlike in the two cell tower case, you can actually be anywhere along this circle. So note that with one cell tower, you knew that you're on a circle. But now with two satellites, you know that you're on a circle. So you, you're going to need one more satellite than the three uh, for, the, for the cell tower trilateration work. So this is called trilateration, when we are figuring out with the system of equations where something is. It only uses distances. There are no angles involved. That's why from a very strict theoretical point of view, it's not called triangulation. But even experts in the field use it sometimes. So don't, you don't have to uh, believe me. But. So anyway, another one is needed to, uh, to give you the precision that, uh, that only two cell towers are. So, because it's a, it's a 3D space here, more or less. So four is the minimum that you can deal with. And now, there are some things here that need to be said. And uh, I'm not going to go into it deeply. But the same thing applies as before. There can be noise. The value is not going to be one point, but it's going to be a region. A very complicated mathematical problem is how does the phone really know the time difference between it and the satellite? And this is a very, very complicated problem. Because, well, I can put the phone to have any time I want. And even if I try to set it correctly, I'm going to press the OK. My pressing OK is probably going to delay it a little. To have a very accurate measurement of this scale, where you're relying on the light speed, okay, you need to measure the time extremely accurately. So very, very technical. But the fourth satellite also is used to stabilize this time measurement. So if you get time values from three satellites, they need to match where the fourth one is. And the GPS system, NASA, whoever operates, they know exactly where each satellite is at every point in time. So the time has to match this kind of uh, triangular inequality. So the phone is using something very sophisticated there. It's not just the simple mask, math that I ask from you. It also has to use the relativistic effects. Satellites are moving really quickly. They are moving really quickly. They are moving so quickly that time passes differently from, for satellites than from us here. And they need to be taken into account because if you miscalculate by a very, very small fraction, then light, the distance that was measured, can be off by hundreds of kilometers. So when you are going to write the piece of code that we are going to practice with in a few minutes, just keep in mind that you are writing a few lines, but behind those few lines, some really, really serious stuff is happening. Very complicated mathematics. And even though uh, at the end you're going to say, oh, we built some projects, but maybe they were not so impressive, just these lines alone are extremely impressive, and you should somehow remember that. So even though your input is not big, your app is doing something quite, quite unique, in my opinion. OK. So let's have maybe a 10 minutes break, 
and then I'm going to change the setup here and we're going to program something. We're going to find the GPS location of my phone and also we're going to figure out what angle it's, it's still to that. See you in 10. So, yeah. with two spheres or with two satellites, it estimates that our position is somewhere on the circle between their intersections. Yeah. With three spheres, the intersection would be a line. Uh, and with four spheres, it's a point, more or less. Something like that, but it's not really the case because when you have the third satellite, uh, when you have this, the third satellite, you actually already pinpoint to two locations in the space. It's going to be either oh. here or, or here, depending on where the third satellite is. Okay. So it's not the line. It's the same case as with the two cell towers. Okay. You can think about this, but visualizing it in 3D is a bit difficult, a bit tricky, especially because I don't want to rotate this much. Yeah, because I was just thinking to bring in another sphere, and then the only intersection is like. Yeah, the other one it's. Let's just say that three satellites are enough actually to to pinpoint where you are because. Uh, you know, I mean, all the systems, your phone can be taught where the Earth is relative to them. So it's going to either have to choose this place or that place. And you're not most, most likely not there for, for everybody's common use. But the fourth satellite is extremely important for making it work in, uh, like that. But, but yeah, important also for you on the, on the ground for this time, uh, time scaling. And uh, the more satellites, the better, because errors can appear here also. Uh, again, they don't really appear because satellites are moving in space with a minimum of distortion. Each satellite knows where it is because it has been programmed to know where it is at every moment in time. So that would be one question that you could ask. How does a satellite know where it is when it's emitting the pulse? So it knows where it is because it has been programmed to know where it is. And if a satellite drifts for some reason, maybe it hits a debris, yeah. meteor or a debris or something, highly unlikely. Highly unlikely because think of the moon or, or some object and how many craters it has. But the moon is huge. The satellite is... I don't know, it is because me a bit bigger or something like that. So what's the chance that it's going to collide with something? It's small, but it can happen. And when that happens, NASA has to update the satellite with information where it is now and where it's going now. And the orbit is going to shift. And it can figure out that something happened to it because our devices will stop working or, or start to behave strangely. Also, the other satellites can be used to tell it so it's a very uh, interesting network of things that can communicate to each other. But, yeah, good question. More so, complicated than I thought it would be. <laughs> it's extremely complicated, and I don't pretend to know the, the solution. And uh, I don't even pretend to know uh, the case when you have uh, when you have errors in measurement, and then you have to decide somewhere in that small area where exactly are you going to be. Even those are quite complicated. And the GPS actually gives you also altitude. So it does use the fourth satellite as well for that one. Not very accurate. Altitude is much more sensitive. Yeah, definitely, in this course, I don't expect you to go anywhere deeper than that system of equations just to get an idea of, uh, of how the math works, but it's really complicated. I, two years ago, when, when I started this course, I had the deep math there, and I tried going a little bit uh, into it, and I think Maybe except one student, everybody was like, okay, this needs to end. Um, and I ended it briefly because this course is not about this kind of stuff. We are using this. So, But I think it's definitely important for you to know what we are using. 
and to expect errors and to expect problems and to know what may cause them. So we need to know a little bit about this. Weren't our phones actually having inside them some sort of atomic uh, clocks? No, uh, satellites have the atomic clocks. The satellites have the atomic clocks. Phones have the, the normal, normal clocks. So I guess uh, quartz vibrations. Or... Yeah, quartz. Yeah. Uh, of course, your phone actually gets the time from the internet and whatever, and it's quite accurate. But how accurate is it? Because, I mean, you can set it to do that. But even that has a latency. You're going to have a request to some service, okay, tell me the time, and then you get the time, but how long did it take to get the time? Yeah, <laughs> you have to correct that. It probably does, but how accurately? And in that fraction of measurement, how much does light move? <laughs> because it moves quite fast. So that, that there are many, many of these... Uh, tricky things to think about and the math is not simple and the physics are not simple but the fact that it works and it tells you and people complain like ah five meters away this is your not a good system but five meters is amazing it, it says I'm on the other side of the street I don't like it <laughs> people say that very often I say that a lot now I retweet my words <laughs> yeah 